morning we are wrapping up a series that we started, hard to believe, 11 weeks ago as we've been journeying through the fruits of the Spirit. And how important are they to the Christian life? I believe that they are foundational and they are also necessary if a person's going to be serving and if they're going to grow in their faith in Jesus Christ because these are the very qualities of Christ. This is what he expects of us. And as we're walking with Christ, we will naturally, naturally bear these fruits in our life. And so what a blessing has been to go through all nine of these. And today we'll wrap it up and try to draw an applicational conclusion to putting this together so that uh, this isn't just something that we hear and it sounds good, but as we've been saying these last few weeks together, that it's something that we can put into practice. And so if you have your outline and in your scripture, uh, we've been looking at these fruits of the Spirit. Let's say this once more together, Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23. Here we have the list of the fruits of the Spirit given to us by the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia. And this is what God lists through him as the fruits of a healthy Christian, the fruits of a healthy believer in Jesus Christ. Let's say it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now say this last part nice and loud. Against such things there is no law. I want you to be able to say this in your sleep, okay? Against such things there is no law. And what I'd like to do is we've focused on every part of this verse. We're going to focus on the last part of this verse this morning because it ties it together nicely in this particular passage. Against such things there is no law. And that gives us a basic understanding in three areas. First of all, there are no man-made justice laws against these fruits of the Spirit. At least not now. Who knows down the line. But as it stands now, there are no laws. In fact, in America, these qualities would be celebrated. You would be admired if you were somebody who had self-control. You would be admired if you were a person who had peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. You would be celebrated as being a, somebody on staff at a school or a workplace, as somebody who had patience, because what in the world is that anyway, okay? And so there's no laws against, man-made laws against these things. And that was the case then, that's the case now. Certainly, secondly, there's no God-ordained laws against these things, because he's the one that put them in existence. There's no laws in the Old Testament that prohibit you from loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. It's encouraged. And so there's no godly laws against it. And then finally, and I believe this is the most crucial one to understand, there are no man-made religious systematical laws that stand against or can manufacture these fruits. And so what I like to discuss with you today is something called spirit-led change. The only way you and I could truly change, go from the old to the new, is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Apart from that, we're just spinning our wheels. It's only a matter of time before we drop off. The, the beautiful blessing of our Christian faith is not, not only, as I've said before, that we get our hell insurance, that God gives us a new life to live. And that's under his power. That's under his grace. But there's a problem that exists in our culture today. There's a common misconception that is in direct opposition to this. And here it is. It's right here in your notes. The common misconception is I could do it myself. I could do it myself. And the hit song that goes with this statement is, I did it my way, okay? And that is how a lot of folks approach everything in their life. I can do it on my own. Even folks who would ascribe to the Christian faith. I can do it myself. And, and there's no surprise to me that this is where our culture is, even in certain spiritual circles. You know, we live in a society that is saturated. I mean, saturated with self. And it, all you got to do is look at some of the top-selling religious and secular books on the shelf. Now, if you have any of these books, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Okay? I, I did not sneak in your house last night and take a picture of your bookcase or, or do anything like that. So if you have this book, it doesn't mean you're bad. I, you know, maybe I have one of these books. That's neutral. But these are titles of books, and they're not bad books. 
But there's a focus on self that could stand in opposition to this overall focus of life to be spirit-led. And here are some titles of books that are out there. Love yourself. Love yourself. And usually psychologists will tell people, you know, the reason why you do all these things is because you don't love yourself enough. Actually, I counsel the opposite. The reason, and I know this because I'm a fellow sinner. The reason why I do stupid things is because I love myself too much. I gotta love God more. And I'll behave the way he wants me to. So love, love yourself, you know, that's a title. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad book. I've never read the book. But love yourself, again, that's a, a self-focused book. And then if you're having trouble with that, you can go by the art of learning to love yourself. You the whole art to it. Learning to love yourself. Celebrate yourself. So I, actually, I like that title of my pridefulness. I, I would love it. You know, celebrate me today. What about you? Celebrate yourself. You're something special. I wouldn't disagree with that. We're something special before God, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your best life now. Now, thank God by, he can give us the ability to live an abundant life here on this earth. But our citizenship is in heaven. Our best life is to come. Self-esteem. You're better than you think. And, you know, recently, well, actually, as a matter of fact, this morning, Joseph has 102 temperature and he's at home. And he's got an earache. And he's got one of them beard, uh, bad earaches when it swells up a little around the lobe. And, and so he was in pain last night and I slept in his bed with him. And he was waking up like every two hours. And he wanted to drink a water um, a couple of different times. And it was nice and cold. Uh, it came out and he, he drank and he went, whoo, that is good, you know. And he, he said that, you know, I thought that was cute. Well, I just FaceTimed because Jen had sent me a text that, he had vomited this morning. So I FaceTimed him, and as I was FaceTiming him, you know, before the call goes through, you see yourself in the full screen. And that was scary for me. <laughs> I, I said, wait a minute, where'd that, other, where'd that other chin come from? I didn't realize I had two of them. And then I go, look at this blemish, and look at that. I, I was thinking, you know what, I, about a half hour ago, I was just going to come up and give the message like this. Galatians 5 and everything, or give it, you know, let the self-esteem, you know, we're always going to struggle with self-esteem, and usually self-esteem problems come when we look in the mirror, and self-esteem is not necessarily a bad thing to struggle with, because when you struggle, struggle with self-esteem, it causes you to look up to God, and you realize your worth comes from Him, not in a mirror or not what anybody else says. So self-esteem, you're better than you think, not so according to my FaceTime experience, a little while ago. Learning the language of self-affirmation and then self-esteem, the new reformation. Why is this? Over the past decade, psychologists, psychoanalysts, and even religious leaders have created this movement called selfism. And selfism elevates, conditions the person to elevate themselves to a mindset of entitlement. And that right there might be the death of our own country one day. An entitlement mindset. And it's unhealthy to believe that way for success in business, success in school, and certainly in your walk with Christ. Actually, it needs to be the other way. We need to live a, 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 a thankful life to God. A thankful life that we can go home and we have a refrigerator. A thankful life that we're alive for another day. You know, that needs to be the, the focus, not self. And so, selfism has one commandment. And it says this, I am the Lord my God. I shall not have strange gods before me. And so, that's the mindset of self. I could do it my way. I could change myself. Now, let me just share this with you. We can't change ourselves. We can't change ourselves. The same way that Jesus Christ is the primary person behind salvation is the same way the Holy Spirit is the primary person behind transformation. Let me say that again. The same way, now listen to this, the same way that Jesus Christ is the person behind salvation is the same way the Holy Spirit is the person behind transformation. God, through His Holy Spirit, allows you and I to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. The good news is you can never leak it nor lose it. It's to seal the deal before God. And that Holy Spirit, which God has filled us with and has indwelt us, is his very instrument of taking you from who you used to be to who you need to be in Christ. 
And so spirit-led change has nothing to do with you and I on our own effort and then calling God in every now and then for a little backup. No. Just like we didn't save ourselves under our own resources, my friends, you're only spinning your wheels if you're trying. We cannot change ourselves in our own resources. And so that is why we're told repeatedly in Scripture, one of the famous Psalms of all time, be still and know that I am God. Perhaps one of the toughest things for us to do. Nice to read, makes a nice plaque, maybe even a t-shirt, but very hard to do. Because spirit-led change doesn't come on our own resources. It comes under God. So here's a good understanding of spirit-led change, spirit-led life, and it's this. Living under God's leadership. Say that verbally. It is the words that will lead to great power in your life if we put it into practice. Spirit-led change is what? Living under God's leadership. You want to be under God's leadership because that assumes certain things, doesn't it? If somebody's a leader, you're following their lead. They're guiding you. They're directing. They're encouraging. They're giving instruction and so forth and on. And so it's highly important that we live under God's leadership. See, it's not enough just to passively surrender so it goes well. There's more to the Christian life than that. It's an aggressive battle. And what we're about to read in Galatians 5, 16 to 26, there's a conflict. There's a conflict between being spirit-led and a conflict with self, the flesh. We all battle it. It's something that we will battle till the day the Lord calls us home. One thing I'm happy about when I check into heaven, one of the many things after I get up there and I get comfortable and everything, I bounce on the bed or whatever I'm going to do up there after I hug the Lord and say hello to a few people. Oh, it, oh how'd that person get in? Well, God is great, whatever. You know, and make, make your way comfortable and everything like that. You know, I'm going to be very thankful, very thankful that I don't got to battle self anymore. I'm going to be very thankful about that because that's my toughest battle. As I've said before, my biggest problem, my biggest foe is the person I shave every four days, me. I can't go blaming, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry for every problem I have. I have to realize that there's a battle going on. And yes, we know about principalities and evil and all of that stuff. But ultimately, ultimately, God has given us free will. It's our greatest blessing and our greatest curse. And we must stand before God and choose to be spirit-led. Choose to be given over to him. Because there are ch there's change that God wants to bring in our life. And I want to share with you this morning, as a result of these nine fruits, five areas of change that the Holy Spirit brings to our lives. And then I want to share with you something that you and I could be doing to complement it. We don't bring the change but we want to take steps that agree with the change, not take steps in the opposite direction. Does that make sense? We don't want to be going in the opposite direction of God. That's why you don't want to fill your heart and your mind with let's puff up self. Now again, it's not evil. It's just counterproductive. Could lead to evil. It's counterproductive. You want to do what's productive in your life. Because I don't know about you. Maybe your life is different than mine. <coughs> but this life is hard enough. It's hard enough to live, to, you know, live for God in this day and age. So I don't want to waste my time putting the wrong things into my spiritual tank. I, I want to put God's word in my heart. Just like it says in Psalm 119, thy word I've hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Not my word I've put in my willpower in my heart that I may not sin against you. So let's look at these five areas of change, shall we? First change, write this down. Highly important. Character change. One of the, the beautiful blessings of the Christian life, we're told repeatedly, the old is gone, the new has come. What's that talking about? It's talking about our character. And in case we're unaware of this, the only thing you're going to take to heaven is not your favorite pair of trousers or shirts or shorts or that picture over the mantle. You know what you're going to take to heaven? Your character. You know what you're going to be, when you stand before God and he determines your rewards for you on earth, you know what he's going to use? Your character. Your character and how you conduct and live your life, it doesn't get you into heaven, but it definitely determines rewards. As we, uh, about three months ago, we did a whole message when we did the heaven series, and we talked about the five crowns mentioned in scripture and how beautiful that was, how we will stand before the Byzantine judgment 
and God will reward based on our faithfulness unto him. Now, we don't get into heaven because of that, but we're certainly encouraged to be motivated to live for his glory here on earth. No matter how young or old you are, it's never too early to start, certainly never too late to live for God's glory. So character change. And this is what character is. When you have a character change by the Holy Spirit, you may have noticed this in your life. I define character change as this in Christ. My private and public life start to become the same. No longer am I Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I even feel a conviction when I'm not living that way. I'm not one person, not one person in front of you and a different person the other way. Now, we all struggle with that. We all, we all, uh, we all you know, verbally throw up on our family at times and... We, you know, gosh, we do things we shouldn't to the people we love because we know they're never going to throw us away. That's probably why, you know. And so I understand that nobody's perfect in these areas, but the truth of the matter is, is that as you walk with Christ, the Holy Spirit's going to do something that no pill, program, or person could ever do for you. It's going to help you let your public and your private life be the same. What it's going to do is it's going to, by God's Spirit, He's going to reveal secrets in your life. Now remember this, because our next series is called Dark Secrets. Secrets make us sick. They do. And, they, they, you know, God sees it all anyway. He knows all things. Psalm 139 tells us that. Where can I go from your presence? The answer is nowhere. He knows our thoughts are far off. He pre-thinks our thoughts. So it's senseless to try to keep secrets from God. But as you walk with God, he's going to do something awesome. He's going to condition and convict you to be one person, not to be two people, not to be a hypocrite. In Jesus' opening teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, he introduced that understanding, not being a hypocrite, not being pharisaical like the religious leaders. It's important that our public and our private life are meld together. Verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5, Paul writing to the church at Galatia, combating some false teaching, as we've said in, the, in prior weeks of the Judaizers, this religious faction that was trying to say salvation plus. And anytime you do that, that's a bad equation. Verse 16, and how we arrive at this understanding of character, Paul says, but I say walk by the Spirit. Underline walk. <coughs> Presco in the Greek language is the word, and it speaks of a progress and a forward motion, a continual forward motion of how a person carries themselves. Quote, unquote, character. But I say walk by the Spirit. In other words, let your character be by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. See, there's no tricks to try to be a better person. It's that my character needs to be given over to Christ because that's one of the very first things that he begins to work on when we become a believer in Jesus Christ. It starts to transform our character. And so, but I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And now we're going to hear about this conflict here, in case we missed it. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. You've probably noticed that, right? The things, again, Paul in another place said, Romans 7, the things I should do, I don't, and the things I shouldn't do, I do. And it's that battle. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, I'm not talking about a bucket list, but the things that you, your spirit wants to do, which is to live for God and to love God. And again, I never met anybody that said, you know what, I don't want any peace in my life. I want to have a, give me all the discord you can give me. You know what, I don't want to be a patient person. I just want to be all over the place. No, people die, would, would give their right arm for patience in a difficult situation. And so we want these things in our life. We want to be blessed by these areas of life. And so it's important that we realize that we have to give our character over to God. But there's a constant battle going on. So here's a lead by, led by the Spirit step we could take in our lives. Form Christ-like habits. Since God has gone the great lens to transform your character, to help us have, and you've probably heard this term before, Christ-like character. Well, we need to start forming Christ-like habits in our life. And these fruits of the Spirit, they are sourced by God and the Holy Spirit. But it wouldn't hurt us in our life to develop habits based on this. For example, take love. 
I'm going to develop a habit that I'm not going to keep a record of wrongs. Right there, what are we doing by doing that? We're canceling out a bad habit. Some of us have a scorecard we keep. We're like, you know, some people are like a sports encyclopedia. They could tell you every score of their team and other teams. And some people are a sin encyclopedia. And they just, they just know what everybody's done, everything like that. They don't really know what they're doing. They're being prideful right now. They're being a hypocrite. They could tell you everything everybody did. And there's always people like that floating around in and out of church. We could develop the habit of keeping no record of wrongs. What about the habit of not being easily angered? What about the habit of what it says in James, being slow to anger? What about that, the, developing the habit of giving to others, giving to God? What about developing a habit of prayer? And on and on it goes. You want to develop Christ-like habits in your life. Now listen now, this is God's will for you. you go, What's God's will for me? This is God's will. That you and I would develop these habits. We would, we would develop habits that agree with who Christ is. And that is ultimately, God gives us a great start. And that is how our public and private life ultimately become the same. That as God has begun the transformation of our character, we take the information we learn from his word and we use it in our life and we are transformed by his word. Second area of change. And how important is this one? Especially in these crazy days we live in. You know, when you turn on the news and you see these things all over, top to bottom. Confidence change. A confidence change takes place. No longer do we trust in our own resources or the government or other people. As you start to walk with Christ, even when you walk through death, the valley of the shadow of death, our confidence now goes to the Lord. We trust in Him. <coughs> We don't trust in ourselves anymore. How important is that for the Christian life? A lot of people go, you know, I have, I have, you know, I have great faith. I have great faith. Well, great faith is not trying to be Dougly do right. Great faith means that you trust God greatly with all the things in your life. Jesus was constantly teaching that to his disciples. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5.18, as we continue this text, he says, but if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. And so, in other words, he's saying if you're spirit-led, as the title of our series is, Spirit-Led Change, the title of today's message, if you are a spirit-led believer, you're not under the law. See, the law in itself, God did not give the law so that man could appease his wrath of sin. The law was given to be a mirror, if you will, that it's impossible for us on our own accord. The Mosaic law in the Old Testament was given for us to see clearly that it's impossible for you and I to please God on our own. And what it does, it points people to God's redemptive plan, which is Jesus Christ. That's why, you know, when the scripture says in the, in the New Testament that there is no name by which men could be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ, it really means that. It's not just a good saying. It's a factual statement, and that is seen throughout history. All of history is pointing to the cross, to the fact that there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of Jesus' blood. And that is the beauty of our salvation in Christ. That's the beauty of the confidence we need to have. So when I think of confidence change, I think of it in two forms. <coughs> I think of it this way. My provisions and my pardons are rooted in Christ, not in religious systems. My provisions, meaning that the things that I need in this life, not a yacht, although that'd be nice. Be nice to go take a, you know, some people take a 7 or 14 day cruise. I, I like to take a, a 365 day cruise, you know, and see the island or something like that. It's not our wants, our needs. Our provisions, our needs are rooted in Christ. Didn't the Apostle Paul say, I have learned the secret of contentment. I've learned what it is to have a little and have a lot. I found all this out and he gets to the end of Philippians 4.19. And he says that my God shall supply for all of my needs. According to who? The state of the economy? No. The state of Christ. From his throne. Our confidence is in him. Not in ourselves. Confidence change for our provisions in our life. And our pardons. We've been forgiven. There is therefore now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. What a, what, a, well, what a deal this is when you start hearing some of this stuff here. Do I got to do anything? Do I got to, you know, they got to pass the offering basket around five times for this? No. The offering was already made on Calvary's cross by Jesus Christ. And the cross should never get old to talk about. It is the substance of who we are. And it's the reason for heaven. It's the reason for salvation and sanctification. A confidence change. To go a little bit further with this, there's a character in the Bible who was a governor. We find out about him in several of the Old Testament books. Haggai uh, prophesies, uh, gives prophecy about his life and about God using him. And of course, Zechariah. In, in Zechariah 4.6, we find mention of this king. And as, let me just set this verse up. We're going to hear about uh, Zerabel. Anybody named Zerabel here? Okay. Governor Z, we'll call him for short, so you can remember him here. Governor Z has the favor of God on his life. He's the grandson of King Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim in the Old Testament was called God's signet ring. Kings would wear a signet ring. It described their authority and their power. But when King Jehoiakim was deported to Babylon... In essence, the scripture tells us that that ring was removed. What's interesting about Governor Z is that he's called the signet ring of God and that it will never be removed. What it was was a picture of how you and I could have confidence in God that as we trust in him, we shall, as we sing, we shall not be moved. And so... God gives prophecies in the Old Testament concerning this king's, uh, this governor's life. He's mentioned as a servant. He's mentioned as a son and mentioned as a signet ring. It's a picture of the Messiah to come. If you were to go dig in the chronology of Jesus, you would find old Governor Z in the lineage of Jesus Christ. He's a descendant of David. And this is what's written concerning him in Zechariah 4, 6. Then the Lord said to me, that being Zechariah the prophet, this is the word of the Lord to good old Governor Z. Not by might nor by power. Listen to the rest of this. You could say it with me. How beautiful is this? But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He was influential in the rebuilt of Jerusalem. He was used greatly for God's purposes in his generation. I get chills reading that verse because there's been a promise that God has made and kept thousands of times. And that is, is that by his power, he will accomplish his will. And it is so comforting to know that because we live in tumultuous times. Any generation, folks could say that. And it ties in together all the truths that we know. That the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. It ties in the great truths that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It ties in the great truths that the tomb is empty in Jerusalem. And that we have a home in heaven. Not by man's might and man's power, but by the spirit of the Lord. He will provide for you in his time. What does that require of us then? I believe understanding Governor Z, understanding the confidence change, what steps do we need to take? You'll notice this. Maintain dependence on God. Say it together. This will help break pride in the room. Say it together. Maintain dependence on God. You know, we're taught, obviously, we, you know, Declaration of Independence, and, and there, that's wonderful. But we don't need to be independent of God. We don't arrive and graduate and think, well, now I don't need God for this anymore. The men and women of God who were used greatly in their lifetime were people who had a dynamic friendship with God. Now, folks in our culture try to call them saints. Some of them were the biggest sinners ever. Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, calls himself the chief of all sinners. And so it's not about again. Look how we like to put the spotlight on self. Paul said... I've died to self. We're going to read that in a moment. Crucified self. Confidence change. It's now all about God. The third change. <coughs> Conviction change. 
all of a sudden something happens as you walk with Christ, as you, as you begin this journey. It's not about us anymore. It's about him. And what that means is, is we get convicted of things we used to do that used to be acceptable, but for some reason, we don't know why, how, and when, but it seems unacceptable. Something's wrong. It doesn't feel good anymore. Something's up. And so I like to think of conviction change as this. My practices now reflect the, my professions of faith. You can't dance with the devil and then think you're going to walk with God. Don't walk, work that way. It doesn't work that way. My practices in this life much match my profession of faith. Now, the list of things that are here, you may not struggle with some of these things. This is a representation of evil. This is what it says here in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. In essence, these are the contrast of the fruits of the Spirit. <coughs> Idolatry. Sorcery, thank you. Strife. Jealousy. Fits of anger. Rivalries. Dissensions. Divisions. Envy. Drunkenness. Orgies and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's understand this in two ways so we're correct. If somebody is continuously walking in these areas and other areas... And, and they don't even care what God says. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And they don't even sense any conviction. Well, that could be an indication that you need to get right with the cross. And that's okay because you're here. It's like if you came in with an open wound, no better place to be than the hospital, right? So if you've come in here today, don't feel judged because Christ was judged for you on the cross. So you're in the right spot. If you've come in here today and you could add to this list, as we all could at some point, don't feel judged. You're feeling conviction. That's not a bad thing. Christ was judged on your behalf. How do we know that? Well, you know what it says in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that very moment in history, as I've said before, the wrath of God was being poured out upon Christ for you and I. And for the first time ever, never to happen again, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, we're separated so that we would never have to be separated from him. So it's not a bad thing to walk into church and for you to be something on this here and, and be involved in these things. You've walked into the right place. You know what you need to do? You need to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Admit your sinfulness to him. Maybe you've already done that as we're, the Spirit of God's already got into your heart. There's no magic pill or prayer to say. You're convicted. You know you're a sinner. You know you need to give over to Christ. Because if not, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And perhaps your life is hanging over hell by a shoestring. And you never know when that shoestring is going to give way. One out of one people die. Part of life. You need to get right with God. You can't make it in on your own accord. Only by what Christ has done. And so if you need to, right now in the quietness of your own heart, Accept Christ into your heart. Believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And if you believe that, and you believe he's Lord, you are saved, and your name is written in the book of life, and it's written in blood, it can never be erased. That is our faith. Because now you have a conviction change that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That's narrow. It's being narrow-minded, Ray. Thank you for the compliment. Truth is narrow. It needs to be narrow. It can't be wide and all over the place, whatever goes. We need to know the directions to heaven. But what if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you struggle with some of these areas? Does that mean you lose your salvation? No, because you can never lose your salvation. What it does mean, though, is that while it's impossible to be possessed by the devil and evil if you're a Christian, it's possible, though, to rub shoulders with it. And to be confused by it. And so we must give ourselves over to God. We must be convicted. And some of these things here, you know, sexual immorality, drunkenness, orgies. They go, he, he said orgies in church. Where's his mother? Get a bar of soap. You know, my mother's sitting right over there. Is that mom? My, eye, my eyes are terrible. There's my mother over there. You might say, put a, put a bar of soap in his mouth. How dare he say that? Listen, it's part of life. It's a scripture. It doesn't mean you're, you're, you're doing any of that stuff. 
But it just gives you an idea of, of the roads folks could go down. The roads we've all went down. Maybe not exactly that. So what do we need to do if we're a believer in Jesus Christ so that we can stay centered with Christ? What do we need to do? Go overboard with boundaries in your life. You can never have enough boundaries in your life. It doesn't mean you're a legalist. But you should have boundaries. I mean, it makes sense. You know, Joseph and I play basketball by the house. And I have this hoop that has fallen down. I don't know how many times I have it taped up with tape and everything. And trying to get as much as I can out of it before I got to buy a new one. <coughs> I don't say, Joseph, when the ball goes in the street, just do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. You want to run in the street, son? Go run in the street. Do whatever you want. No, a boundary has been set. And what's the boundary? Do not go in the street. <laughs> very clear, very direct. God wants us to have direct boundaries in our life. Now, somebody once said it this way. It's better to go overboard than to be thrown overboard. And if we're not careful, even though we love the Lord and we want to be spirit-led, in case you haven't noticed, temptation's all around us. And if we're not careful, if we don't have boundaries in just about any area of life, uh, we could get thrown overboard by sin and struggles and storms and everything else. And so we must go overboard in those areas. You're not being a legalist. That's a smart and wise thing to do. For change. Conscience change. Conscience change. What is con conscience change? I don't even know how to spell conscience. Okay, I have trouble spelling that word. So what in the world is it then? Conscience is this. My perspective becomes spiritually healthy. See, a lot of times before we know Christ, we base everything on how I feel. I felt it was the right thing to do. I feel this. I feel that. But good intentions, if you're not careful, could pave the way to hell. So you don't want to base everything on, on, on what we feel all the time. It's important to recognize, well, what does God require of me? Well, what does God require of us? That we would ultimately reflect Christ. And we've studied this in detail. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. The fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, a healthy believer is going to produce this in their life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Tying this into what we just contrasted with, the, the works of the flesh. We're going to struggle. Nobody bats a thousand. We understand that. The difference is, is now that we have conviction. And now our conscience is telling us, this isn't so right anymore. And again, as we said last week, you can have, just list any struggle you have. Nothing is too big for God. That's one of the reasons why we have church to help people maximize the change that God wants for them. Imagine if every week all we did was pick on a, sin, a particular sin every week. Oh, today we're going to talk about this person. And today we're going to talk about that person. How hypocritical would that be? You know, some people, they get off. They want to hear, you know, they tell it like it is messages. God's all about telling us how it should be. Big difference. How can it be in him? A conscience change as we walk with Christ. The fruits of the Spirit give us that. Love. The love of God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. And love others as ourselves. Love. To manifest that. <coughs> to let our conscience be about that. Joy and peace and patience and kindness. Faithfulness. Meekness. Gentleness. And then self-control and gentleness. I kind of look as the application of these other fruits. A conscience change in our life. And so what's the step we need to take here? I would look at it this way. As we're led by the Spirit, we need to evaluate change in our life by fruit, not feelings. Big difference. Let's say that together. Evaluate change by fruit, not feelings. If you want to say, okay, this is how, where I am in Christ right now in my life, what you want to do is you want to look and see, okay, am I bearing fruit? Am I a loving person? Or do I continue to bite everybody's head off every time there's a problem? I don't got nothing to anger. I got no anger problems. What are you saying? Well, maybe some things need to be worked on. I don't have patient problems. What is this going to happen already? You know, 
Listen, we're all there. No, nobody's better than anybody here. Isn't that, you know, you didn't get in here. We don't have reserved seating for people. Okay, everybody who has it together, you sit over here. And the rest of us losers will sit over here. And then the fakes and the phonies, they'll sit over there. You know, it, sometimes we think like that, don't we? But as our conscience change and our perspective changes, we begin to evaluate things differently, don't we? We evaluate things now based on the fruits of the Spirit. The guide for your life, the measuring stick, the barometer needs to be the fruits of the Spirit. And if I'm loving myself more than I'm loving God, well guess what? I got to get with the cross. I got to get with Christ. And I got to give that over to Him. I got to give my life back over to Him. I, maybe I've gone off course, whatever it may be. But I got to get right with God. And He loves me. He's been waiting for me. He's patient. I'm not, but He is. I got to let the mask Take the mask off and get right with him and stop pretending it's not an issue. I've got to evaluate on fruit. Where am I? Am I out of control? Do I think I need things that I really don't need? I need Christ. I don't need a, another person. I don't need another possession. I don't need another drink. I, don't, I need Christ. He needs to be the substance of who we are. He's the author of true recovery. There's no recovery apart from Christ. There, there's no healing apart from Christ. You know, some people go, why did Jesus heal in the gospel? Well, we know why some of his followers did. They thought it was a sideshow. King Herod did. You know, some of his followers said, man, he's good for business. Let's bring him along. This whole, you know, fill the boats with fish trick, that's pretty awesome. Walk on water trick, heal leprosy, whoa. He was healing to demonstrate the power of God that comes from his throne. And it's that same power that parted the Red Sea. It's that same power that closed the mouths of the lions. And my friends, it's that same power that came upon Mary when she was found to be with child. She had never known a man. It's that same power that when there was no hand and Jesus touched the leper and a hand appeared. It's that same power that rose folks from the dead. It's that same power that healed the blind instantly. No patch over the eye and come back in six weeks for treatment. And it's that same power that rose Christ from the dead. And that's why our faith is exclusive. Because of those truths. And we evaluate based on fruit. And so based on these truths, my friends, there's one last change that I want to tell you about. Write this down. There's the commitment change. The commitment change. There's a new loyalty now. You know what the old loyalty used to be? To self. You know what this book, we would mentioned books at the top of the message. You know what this book says our loyalty needs to be? To God. To heaven. And I make you promise. You won't get to the end of your life living like this and having regrets. Actually, the opposite is sadly enough true. For folks who don't live their life to the loyalty of Christ, there's regrets. But as the Apostle Paul said, is if we could be poured out like a drink offering, if we can run the race and fight the good fight, what does that assume? That there's been a commitment change. And we are what we are committed to. You're committed to a good marriage, you can have a good marriage. You're committed to building a relationship with your child. They get a little crazy, we know, from certain, you know, like 16, they think they know everything. 22, they, they've mastered everything. And then they come back home, you know, their mindset after a while. Maybe money runs out or something like that. But every once in a while you get, you know, you get a kid who's, who's ahead of their years. And they don't think that way. You know, it was all over the news and it was sad about that New England Patriots gifted player who um, was charged with murder of a, um, a semi-pro football player. And he actually went to college with Tim Tebow, who regardless of what any people try to say, I think he's a tremendous athlete, tremendous football player, and even Ben and I, he's a tremendous believer in Jesus Christ. So they interviewed his coach and they said, because they found out that Tim would try to help him and they actually broke up a fight one time at a bar and other issues that went on. And they said, how come Tim Tebow, you know, didn't have the, the same tendencies that all these other kids and this guy had and other things. He says, because usually, you know, college guys 
who, you know, who are athletes, or any, any guy for that matter, has, this is the three things that are on their mind. Women, women, and women. Those are the three things that are on their mind. And he said for Timmy, it was God, it was God, and it was God. And I said, wow, what an incredible statement for somebody who's not a, his pastor or anybody else to make of him. And that needs to be the case with us, I believe, in our lives. That, that, that's where God wants us to be because that's the right priority, isn't it? And that's what commitment change is. This is what it is. My priorities bring honor to God. Can we say that together? My priorities bring honor to God. As I live a spirit-led life, all of a sudden, <coughs> my priorities have changed. My priorities are about bringing God honor with my life, not getting mine. But living for His glory. Big difference. And that is a blessable life. If you want the favor of God on your life, that is the way to live, it bar none. It's not the only reason why we do it. But there's nothing wrong with some positive affirmation of living for God's glory. And he promises that where he guides, he provides. He has a 100% track record in this area. And he will never fail, you and I, in this area. So what is the step we need to be taking here? As it says in this scripture here that you and I are to look to Christ and to be devoted over unto him. Paul says that I have, let me just read it for you here. He says this at the end of this teaching here in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They've crucified it. They've died to self. That's what that means. He says if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That's our responsibility. God's responsibility, He saves us, He initiates the change process, the transformation. Our job is the application. God does the salvation, the justification, the sanctification of changing us. One day the glorification in heaven, you have a new body, you're fit for a new life, a new spirit drive. Amen. Our responsibility, our number one duty, and we just got this one thing to do, everything else is tied to it, application. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into what? In, on the bookshelf, into practice. The Lord says, test me or come reason with me. I will make you whiter than snow. My friends, a commitment change means it's an all-out, full-court press in life to depend on God, to cast all our cares upon Him. This is the Spirit-led life. This leads to Spirit let change. And so the step, as Paul says, keep in step. This is the step I want to encourage you with as we close. Remain on God's spirit-led path. He began that path, didn't he? He made the path very clear by way of the cross, didn't he? And he has bridged every gap that you have in your mind right now. Well, I'm to this. That's a gap. That's a chasm. He bridged it. Here's the bridge right here. Oh, I did. There's the bridge right there. Every time you begin, oh, I'll never change. Well, don't worry. You never will on your own power. But if you are spirit-led, it's going to change everything. Now, for example, you may not want to come to church today. You might want to be at the beach. But because you are spirit-led, you want to be here. <laughs> You may not want to give in a little bit. No, I give and that's all it's about is money. In case you haven't noticed, as, as strong as our guys are when you come through the doors, nobody picked you up by your ankles and shucked the money out of you. <laughs> Church is not about money. Because God owns it all anyway. Amen. We're to give as an act of worship. It's actually a privilege to give back if you ask me. Well, don't ask me, ask God. It's a beautiful opportunity actually. We don't give in our own selfishness. We give because we're spirit-led. We serve at the sports camp or the painting. Or we go out and we share Christ with people. We go and get involved in these various ministries. Because we love Christ. You open up your home for a Bible study because you love Christ. 
You serve because you love Christ. That is the way to live this life. You change from being a rude and angry person to becoming a loving disciple of Jesus Christ because of Christ. You go from being this person who has that scorecard to being a person of grace. How? Because of Christ. It's all by Jesus Christ. And the Spirit-led life, Spirit-led change represents a change in commitment. And we want to remain on that path. You know, as I close, there's a beautiful song. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. And some of you, I saw you reaching for your purses and other things. Don't run out. It's by one of my favorite uh, singers and writers. He, he, not only is he a good song, like people write, uh, sing songs, they didn't write them. And, and glory be to God for their voice. This guy writes them and sings them. And what a beautiful song here. It's Lord, I Need You by Matt Meyer. And it says this, uh, Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, how I need you. Every hour I need you. My defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you are my hope. And I say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. If you believe that, say amen. amen. If you believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, say amen. amen. If you believe that only God could transform you, say amen. amen. And if there's something you have in your heart that you need to give God, do you believe if you give it to Him, by His Holy Spirit, He will bring about change? What's your response? Amen. My friends, Live the Spirit-led life and settle for no imitations. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love that is unconditional. We thank you that your promises never change. The grass winters and the flowers fade, but your word stands forever. And your promises stand forever. Lord, we don't just want to come before you now in this prayer time and ask you to bless the deal. We want you to be the, the whole big deal, God. We want it to be all about you, God. So we commit ourselves before you today. We thank you for these changes that your Holy Spirit has initiated. We want to apply your truths. We don't just want to be hearers of the fruits. We want to be doers too. Lord, you're the only one who can turn darkness into light. You're the only one, Lord God, who, who was able to part the Red Sea, Lord God. You're the only one, Lord God. The only one. The only one who has knew us before the foundations of the earth. No other God. There's no other faith. Mormonism, Islam, Hinduism, Lord, all respectful in their own right to their own followers at times, but bankrupt when it comes to the greatest problem of mankind, which is sin, which you conquered on the cross. We thank you <coughs> for the overwhelming proof that exists of our faith. We thank you that the greatest proof of all is the empty tomb in Jerusalem. We thank you that your plans and your promises and your purposes stand forever. We pray that by your grace, trusting in no other way, 
but you, that we would live the Spirit-led life for your glory. We commit ourselves now in honor of who you are and in complete loyalty in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said,